Hello friends, welcome back to this lecture number 18 on the course on the psychology of language. Now the 18th and 19th lecture which is this lecture and the one which is supposed to follow this would be the last lectures in this particular course and we will have a 20th lecture, we will round off everything and give you a de detailed overview of what the course is uh, all about and what the subject matter of the course is. Now since we have uh, ventured through most of the aspects of language and the psychology of it, an interesting topic I thought to include into the course as the last lectures is the idea of bilingualism. Uh, so why bilingualism? Why did I think of this topic? Truly speaking, uh, in our research as well, in the one that I do in my laboratory, when we are doing language related research, one problem that we face is a pure language person. Now, when I say a pure language person, I am referring to someone who is called a monolingual. So, monolingual is a person who has learned only one language. But in a country like India, we know that most people come from different states and so they have at least two or three languages that they know. On top of it, they know the English language which is a language for communication, which is a language for scientific uh, methodology and science and uh, which is a language for exchange of ideas or use in any uh, public offices <coughs> as well. So, I included this section of bilingualism to give a detailed view of what is being bilingualistic, what are the features of bilingualism, uh, what parts of the brain uh, get involved in bilingualism, the cognitive factors affecting it and an overview of bilingualism for that matter. Now before we start today's uh, lecture on bilingualism, what I will do is I will do a small recap of what we have done up till now, how we started the journey and how we crossed several landmarks and reached this point of bilingualism. So the story of a journey starts with looking at what is language uh, for that matter, uh, what does it mean. And for studying language, the first thing that we needed to know is to look at the very primitive form of language. To to strip everything from language and look at the bare bone language. Now, there is a distinguish between language and communication and language as we know uh, by definition is a medium of exchanging ideas. So, the basic form of language is called the communication. So, I focused on my first two lectures on to what is communication. Now, even human communication is a little bit difficult. So, for understanding the basics of language, I started off by looking at animal communication system, which is a very, very basic and primitive form of communication system. So, we looked at the animal communication system, what it is. We looked at some examples of the animal communication system, for example, the vagal dance or the honey bee or the calls of the vervet monkeys and so on and so forth and describe the characteristics of a system of language used by animals. Now that gave us an idea of what a language should have and what should it should not have. And so we proceeded next into understanding the human language system with all its intricacies and bells and whistles. So we started off lo by looking at the language uh, in, in, in terms of its phonemes uh, that combines to get morphemes and then uh, moving up ahead into the level of the word, then word making sentences, sentences making discourse and so on and so forth and looking at uh, rules. Uh, syntactic structures and rules for using the language. So, what we were interested in is finding out how the human language system or to what extent the human language system is different from the animal language system. We proceeded further and started looking at the evolution of the human language system, <coughs> the language uh, for that matter. We looked at how the existence of the language gene or this, uh, the social continuity discontinuity theories, they gave a basis of how language would have evolved from the ancient uh, ancestors that we had. And lastly, we looked at some evidences or from fossilic ev evidences that give us an idea of how language would have evolved for us or how language would have 
uh, provide some basis uh, would have had some scientific basis or some uh, predecessor to its evolution. So, those steps, those milestones which describe how language would have evolved. Now, once we had described all these things, once we had a little bit of history of language and a little bit of definition of what language would mean and what language exactly is. The next step obvious was looking into how language is dealt in scientifically. So, we looked at the scientific procedure of doing research in language. The first step of course, was defining the scientific method for doing language starting from a body of theory to uh, deducing hypothesis out of it and then producing uh, testing this hypothesis based on some data and then uh, formulating a solution and testing the solution against the uh, theory uh, to either verify or falsify the theory. So, we looked at this process of how this theory leads to data and the data again uh, either extends the theory or falsifies it. So, we looked at the whole idea of what is a scientific process. We looked at experimental designs, various kinds of experimental designs that we use in doing uh, language research in the laboratory uh, using the uh, um, within subject and between subject designs and a little bit into other kinds of designs which are used in doing research on language. The next thing that we looked at is various kind of behavioral techniques of doing language research and two important measures of any language research or any language related research is the latency or the reaction time and uh, the second being the accuracy or how correct a response is in language. So, we looked into detail how this uh, latency and accuracy form uh, some of the behavioral principles into doing language research. And lastly, we looked at how language and brain are related. So, what are the different areas of the language uh, uh, brain, uh, the Broca and the Wernicke area, what are the different mechanisms or uh, different equipments which are used for measuring brain responses in language and how the brain and language ability is related to each other. Particularly, we were interested in the Broca and the uh, Wernicke area. Now, once we had an idea of how to do research in language, the next obvious thing was to understand how language is perceived or how somebody uh, perceives language. And so, the, we started our journey into perception of language by it first describing what is auditory perception. So, we started looking at those factors of auditory perception. For example, what is a wave, what is amplitude of a wave because language generally is understood in terms of the basic form of language understood in terms of the spoken language. So, we started looking at what are waves, what are the different forms of waves and how to measure it and so on and so forth. Further to it, we also started looking at how the language is perceived using the ear. So, we looked at the dynamics of the ear, we looked at the structural and dynamical uh, format of the ear and how the ear uh, receives these sound waves which are produced which are uh, produced as a language output and makes meaning out of it. We ventured into the idea of the speech stream which is measuring the wave which is outputted in terms of the spoken language and looking at characteristics of it in terms of vowel and consonant production, the production of sorens, the, the idea of continuity of language, the idea of how breaks are there and so on and so forth. And we did all these by using something called a spectrograph which looks at how these wave formats which contain language, spoken language for that matter, what does it contain and what are the meaning of it. The next thing of, of importance was the development of speech perception. So, how speech perception starts and how children uh, acquaint themselves to the mother ease and other forms of conversation, other forms of attachment process through the caregiver and the small child and he develops the idea of language perception. And lastly, we looked at some theories of language perception uh, starting with the idea of motor theory, then the frame, uh, then uh, uh, the auditory framework theory and lastly uh, uh, limiting ourselves to the idea of direct realism as explaining language. So, we by this time we had completed of understanding how language is, uh, is uh, perceived, but the next obvious question was how language is produced. So, how does the production of language starts and so we started off looking at the production of language. There we looked at the idea of the vocal cord which produces language, spoken language for that matter and how speech is produced. So, the, all the vibrations of this vocal cord, how these vibrations produce the various consonants and vowels and how these consonants and vowels uh, they combine together to produce languages or speech stream. 
Uh, then we looked at certain speech areas of the brain, for example, most dedicated are cells into the Broca and the Wernicke area, how they are connected, how there is a ventral and the lateral uh, flow of information and uh, what uh, areas other than the Broca and the Wernicke area are involved into the language. We looked at several models of speech perception, uh, for example, the feed, feedback model, the DIVA model, which is a computational model and some other models of language uh, production. And Lastly, we looked at how the development of speech production happens in children through the use of again the use of um, ex expressions, uh, babbling and so on and so forth and so, so uh, how these uh, formats of uh, uh, behavior by the smaller children actually lead them to producing the uh, mother tongue or the basic language and other languages as well. So, once we had completed the idea of how language is perceived and, and uh, produced and also understood a little bit of what is language and the science of language. The next obvious answer was looking at how words are produced. So, speech sounds are one thing, but these speech sounds, the phonemes they combine together to form meaningful units uh, which exchange ideas and these meaningful units which exchange ideas or which stand as symbols are called words. So, the next obvious answer was looking at words. So, we dedicated a three section or uh, three lecture section onto the words. We looked at looking at what is the anatomy of a word, what is the different kind of words which are there, the functional and uh, the content word and how word leads to symbolism or how words transfer ideas between people. Next we looked at uh, the storage of words, so how different words are stored uh, in, in, in the mental lexicon. So, uh, in, in terms of how uh, uh, words are learned, I am sorry, so we started looking at how words are learned, how children learn words, how the steep curve is there in learning and what kind of processes or what kind of interactions the child goes through while learning a, uh, different kinds of words. The next obvious thing is that once a child has learned a word, how does he store it? And so, we were interested in looking at the cortical and lexical organization of words. So, we looked at how the semantic memory principles of the hierarchical structure of uh, the cortex and uh, the lex mental lexicon explains how words are stored. And lastly, we were interested in looking at the retrieval of uh, word from the mental lexicon. And so, we looked at how the spoken recognition happens. And and we looked at uh, the theories of Levert's theory and the Dell interactive model, which gives us some understanding of how the retrieval of the word really happens. Now, once we have words with us, these words are symbol to certain kind of uh, meaning, but then these words need to be combined into bigger sentences, because one word would not mean anything. And so, next step was looking at how these words are combined together into longer structures which are called sentences. So, we looked at the idea of what is a sentence and what is the structure is sentences, uh, sentences are uh, really about. So, the first step that we needed to do was to look at uh, the idea of a sentence, what is a sentence and what does it do. So, we started off by looking at the structure of a sentence, what is the structure of a sentence looks like. We looked at how uh, the, uh, the sentence can be broken down uh, in, into its uh, phrases, into its clauses and, the, and that kind of a thing and how the concept of uh, uh, the agent and the patient or the subject and the predicate, they explain the structure of a sentence. So, all in all we were doing is what is understanding the structure of a sentence and the syntactic structures and how complexity is added on to it. The next thing obviously was once we had under, an understanding of what is the sentence of a structure, the next thing that we wanted to do was to look at how con comprehension of sentence actually happens in uh, both adults and infants. And so, we started by looking at how errors in sentences, forming of sentences gives us an idea of how sentences are comprehended, how the theory of minimal attachment and the theory of priming and anticipation explains that. Uh, the comprehension of sentences in both adults and children. The third thing that we were interested in is how sentences are produced. So, once we have an idea of how they are uh, comprehended, the thing was how do we produce sentences and we looked at the, the, uh, the uh, vertical and horizontal flow of information as giving us some idea of how uh, sentences are uh, uh, produced and we're looking at the, uh, the scope and visual attentions also playing its role into production of sentences. The last thing that we wanted to do was to look at 
uh, the, the syntactic structure, the structure of how sentences are formed, the grammatical structure of how sentences are formed, how they are learned by children. So, we looked at uh, the model of sen uh, sentence acquisition, the incremental structure building model and some other uh, idea of uh, which are gained from impairments in language which gives us how language structures are learned by both adults and children. Adults of course, have developed it. So, it is basically in, into children, how children learn this model. Once we have sentences, we need to exchange the sentences between people and that exactly is called discourse. So, the next thing of interest was looking at discourse. Now, discourse has two forms, one is called the conversation, the other is called the narrative. So, we focused both on two conversations and narrative. We started looking at what is conversations, anatomy of a conversation in terms of how uh, people understand uh, turn giving and, and turn in interaction and constructing turns in, in terms of how they understand that when is their term to speak. Conversations employ many people talking with each other, taking turns and expressing ideas. Then, so uh, we looked at into the basics of that. The next thing we were uh, looking at is understanding what is a narrative. So, in a narrative one person speaks and the other listens to them. We looked at story grammar as a form of narrative and looked at how the story grammar gives us some uh, idea about how narrative progresses and then other idea of references and uh, the how these referencing helps in forming a narrative. The next thing that we were looking at is anaphora and inferences. Anaphoras are those words which I use instead of the contained words. For example, using if which is a pronoun in, in terms of referring to the uh, person uh, in question and how they uh, help us in uh, making inferences and uh, understanding the sentence in a better way. And the last thing that we were interested here is was, uh, how the development of discourse ability, uh, ability happens in children in terms of gestures, in terms of course speech, uh, in terms of using gestures, in terms of uh, turn taking late talkers and so on and so forth and using the grass, uh, Gracian maxims, understanding how this develops into smaller children. The last thing that we were doing in the last two classes was looking at reading and writing. Now, as we looked at reading and writing is an ability which is a newly developed ability because the brain does not come equipped with the reading and writing ability. And so, we focused on the writing system first, looking at what are different writing systems, the three basic uh, writing systems in the world which exist and the orthography of these writing systems. Secondly, we looked at the cognitive processes in reading which are involved and so, we looked at how eye movements give us an idea about uh, reading and uh, how text comprehension happens and the various models of lexical uh, excess helps us in understanding the cognitive process processes related behind uh, reading. The third we uh, d dwell into development of reading skills. So, how learning to read uh, or how the development of dyslexia gave us an idea about uh, the ability to read and <coughs> how early intention early intervention can help us in treating dyslexia and then we moved into the cognitive processes in writing that is the fourth thing that we did we looked at how the abc's of learning really happen how spelling can give us uh, some idea about what is writing and learning of text and composing text uh, how uh, the hayes model helps us in uh, understanding those cognitive factors which are effective in uh, learning. And so, now we are here into the idea of what is bilingualism, which I explained to you earlier is the process of speaking two languages. As you look around yourself, most people in the world are bilinguals except a few countries for example, America and uh, the United States and the United Kingdom, those are monolingual people. And the monolingual people are those people who are able to speak only one language. So, those people who are able to speak only one language are monolingual and most good examples are the people from the United States or from Britain. These people are the ones which are monolingual. All other people beside these people are bilinguals as they can shift between different languages. So, then what are bilingual people? Now, bilingual people are those people who are able to speak two or more languages. Look at any language in India or uh, any kind of person in India. For example, myself I can speak both Hindi and English, uh, Hindi being my mother tongue and English being a uh, language which I have learned growing up. And then the, a little bit of uh, Punjabi is something which I can uh, speak 
speaks so three languages in it in total. Uh, Punjabi is something which I cannot read and write, but I can understand. Hindi and English are languages which I can read and write. Of course, I think I have lost the ability to write Hindi properly, but then that happens because you do not use that. And so, one of the things that bilinguals do is that they are able to learn to speak in two or more languages. And most people in the world generally are bilinguals as I had been explaining to you. So, these are the same people who can use two or more language. Now, <coughs> why do bilingualism exist or why do bilinguals uh, the, the study of bilingual is important. The first thing is the globalization has led to an increase in immigration and so people move out of their own states or most people move out of India and go to the United States so to work on Britain or those kind of monolingual country. And so when you go to a country like that it is expected of you to learn their language. Of course, the most prominent language speaking people will not allow you to function in your language. And so that is one reason for bilingualism to be uh, uh, to be effective. Now, in addition the emergence of English as a global language of business and science uh, means that most people have to understand English and so that is one reason why uh, bilinguals are uh, required. Now, bilinguals they for they come in various form. Uh, the first form of bilingual is called a balanced bilingual. Now, this is a person who grows up speaking two languages and can communicate equally well in either of them. So, if you are a bilingual, if you are a balanced bilingual, you are one of those people who can communicate in uh, both the language very well. So, for me example, I am a, a balanced bilingual because I, I, I know very well Hindi as well as English and I, I can always switch between Hindi and English. That is something very interesting that I do in my classes. I keep on shifting between both the languages in equal ways. Now, one thing that happens out of it is that I can express my idea sometimes better in Hindi and sometimes better in English and that way I can reach to the uh, student in a much better way. So, they are uh, they are ba uh, balanced bilingual who can shift between uh, both the languages at the same time, but there are only a uh, few bilinguals who are truly balanced in nature. And so, we come to the idea of the other kind of bilingual. So, most uh, bilinguals are not balanced, but I preferred or dominant language and you can uh, see that most bilinguals do not have uh, this balanced uh, format and so they have one dominant language. For example, the dominant language uh, in my case both languages are equally well, but for most people the English becomes the dominant language. Now, we learn the foundation of a language at home and uh, uh, as a children uh, and school is also an environment for learning uh, the language development especially in vocabulary literacy. And the language of the child is educated in becomes the dominant language of adulthood. And so, the reason why people have one dominant language is that school teaches them. So, if you go to an English medium school English becomes a dominant language although you are Hindi speaking and so that is one of the things to be looked at. Now, some people uh, will be counted as bilingual or not depending on whether you uh, view the linguistic system they are familiar with as a distinct language or rather as a different dialect from the same language. You also have something called a unbalanced lingual, lingual is a person who has limited ability to second speak in the second language. And so, both form of uh, bilinguals exist a balanced and un unbalanced uh, bilingual. Now, languages and dialects. Now, there, there are something called different languages and uh, dialects is actually a, a form of a language which is which is a, um, I would say an equivalent of a language. So, we naively view language as discrete entities with national boundaries. So, when we talk about people, we talk about people having fixed language systems or uh, fixed na uh, with boundaries they have fixed language systems. For example, we believe that French is the most dominant language in France, it Italian speak it, uh, it Italian uh, is spoken in Italy, Spanish is spoken in uh, Spain and German is uh, spoken in G Germany and Deutsch is spoken in Germany for example and they call it Deutschland. And so, this, this kind of things we, we believe that certain national boundaries have this kind of a language. Now, often times related languages exist along a continuum. For example, the Dutch German continuum from Amsterdam to Berlin. Now, if you look at if you start from Amsterdam which is a small region here if you seen how Europe is like and you move to Berlin which is right at uh, the eastern side of Europe and this is right at the north western side and as you move along you will see that languages keep on changing. So, you start with Dutch which is the language of the Netherlands and how the dialects how it is uh, 
uh, starts evolving or how it starts changing until unless you reach Berlin here we will find the standard German or the st standard Deutsch and as you move from Berlin to Vienna you start find the something called the standard Ostreich which is another form of uh, uh, German which is the German itself having the pure German. So, most standard Germans are spoken in Berlin and the less standard German is spoken in uh, the Dutch Netherlands. But as you move along boundaries you see that the dialects are there the uh, the form of language expressions are there which is not exactly the true language but it is a it's a, it's a dialect of it which basically means it is a uh, form of it which is not the true um, expression or the true format. Now, distinction between language and dialect is more political than linguistic. This belief that language and dialect distinction is more political in nature and has nothing to do with the linguistic properties. Netherlands and Germans are separate countries, so they are treated as separate languages. Although, if you look into it, the idea of Deutsch, the word and German, they are more or less the same, they come from the same family. Now, similar continuum of Chinese dialects uh, comes from Beijing to Shanghai. So, if you are moving from Beijing to Shanghai, Beijing being using the, the basic form of Chinese and so as you move along this form of Chinese gets slowly uh, written off or written off and you find some variations of it. So, a well, lot of variations happens as you move to uh, Shanghai which is not exactly the same form of Chinese that the classic form of Chinese that is used in Beijing. Now, mutual in intelligibility degrees to which speakers of two languages or dialects can understand each other is known as mutual, mutual intelligibility. And the mutual intelligibility is the ability of the people to understand each other's language. Uh, that is uh, one thing. So, linguistics avoid uh, the language dialect uh, conundrum altogether by assessing something called the ling uh, mutual li intelligibility. Instead, what they believe is that uh, they consider the degree to which speakers of two different languages or dialects can understand each other is called as mutual intelligibility. Uh, for example, Americans and British English are mutually uh, intelligible even though there are obvious differences between them. Now, uh, we can assume that if a speaker of language A can understand the uh, speaker of language B, the reverse should be true, but this is not generally the case. So, if A understands the speaker of language A understands the uh, language B, uh, the reverse of that is not always true. As you can see the map of Europe as you see there are uh, several regions you have <coughs> Sweden and so by dif by different boundaries. So, although there are clear cut political boundaries in Europe the linguistic boundaries are blurred. So, people from Denmark uh, people from Netherlands when they move into Germany they they uh, carry with them the same form of Dutch and so as they keep on moving and here is where the Berlin is. So, what will happen is a little bit of variation happens and so if you move into Austria and this is Vienna another form of language. So, the German which is used in Berlin and the German which is used in Vienna this is a different kind it is called Ostreich, but most structures are same and similarly in Netherlands it is same. So, people believe that because people have boundaries or the countries have boundaries and these boundaries make them uh, strictly use a different kind of language or linguistic boundaries. Now, the reverse of true is in this country. So, here what happens is there are different states and so the different boundaries they are not equivalent and so uh, they would have different languages, but look at China, there is a single state and so as you look at people moving from Harbin to Shenyang or Beijing or Nanjiang, what happens is although mainland China is a single political unit, its people speak a dozen mutually un, unintelligible dialects. So, although in this case people speak something called intelligible dialects uh, in, in, in terms of Europe, in this being one state people should be speaking one language if a political boundary is the reason for how language is. But then what we found out is that people in Beijing and Nanyang and Shanghai, they speak uh, some kind of dialects which are unintelligible, mutually unintelligible dialect which means that people from uh, Beijing will not be able to understand languages from people from Shanghai. Uh, now, uh, there is a good example of mutual intelligibility in terms of the Danish and the Swedish. Now, Swedish adults have more difficult decoding Danish than Danish adults do about Swedish. Why? Uh, because uh, Danish uh, 
uh, people learn uh, Swedish people do not have to learn Danish, but Danish people have to learn Swedish if they want to come and work there. So, however, Swedish and Danish preschoolers perform equally well in decoding the other language. This suggests that implicit social attitude influence the Swedish adults performance. And so, this is the percentage correctly decoded, these are the adults and these are the children. And if you look into it, the differences in terms of children are less than in terms of adults, in terms of Swedes de uh, decoding the Danes and the Danes decoding the Swedish. Now, since the Danes they moved to Sweden for education and other purposes. So, it is believed that the Danes should be able to understand Swedish and this is the difference. So, with adults it is dif dif uh, difficult or it is another way, but in children it is uh, it's another way of uh, uh, ability to understand. Now, immigration accounts for most instances of bilingualism in the United States and there is also a very predictable pattern of language uh, shift across generations in immigrant families. Now, we have something called the heritage language, immigration to United States, so you see that most people move out of their countries and go to the United States and they carry the bilingual word with them. So, spoken in the immigrant's country of origin. So, when people move from their country to a, 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 another host country, for example, people moving from India or any other country to the United States, the first form of language, the heritage form of language is the form of language which is stored, uh, stored, uh, spoken in the country's origin. For example, if Indians move out of India and go to the United States for work, Indian or uh, Hindi typical language is the one which is the heritage language. What is the societal language? This is spoken by majority of people in a given society. So, if you are moving from India into the United States, English is called the societal language and Hindi is called the heritage language. And most people when they move, they start forgetting this. Uh, the first generations know it and they feel proud to have uh, this in language, but as generations move about, what happens is English becomes the most focused because this is the language in which most communication is happening and this is the societal language. So, three generation pattern, let us look at how generation after generation uh, deals with this heritage language as a societal language. And so, what happens is that in the first generation, heritage language is dominant, varying degrees of proficiency in uh, society language. The people who actually move, for example, suppose I move now to the United States forever, what would happen is I will be the first generation and in my generation the heritage language will be dominant and the proficiency in the societal language which is English will be less. But my children which is the second generation, the, they learn heritage language at home, but prefer societal language which is dominant. So, my children will still, they are born in the United States and so as they are born in the United States, their language preference with the societal language would be English and so they will be more proficient in English, but they will still learn Hindi because I am still there, my dominant language is still there. And the third generation, my children's children, they will speak only societal language, but little or no proficiency in the heritage language. So, I said I am not there and not children, uh, I have not taught my children enough of Hindi, what would happen is they will not be able to pass on. So, in the third generation itself, what will happen? The societal language will become the most spoken language and the most interactive language. Incomplete first language acquisition, now failure to attain full native speaker proficiency or the first language. Now, what happens is in the third generation, what happened? There will be something called the incomplete first language acquisition. Why? Because second generation did not pass out anything. And so, it is basically a failure to attain full native speaker proficiency in the first language. Also, typical among those immigrants those children uh, who became native speakers of societal language is this incomplete first language acquisition that happens. Now, multi-generation uh, bilingualism, what are this? Now, in many areas of the world, multiple ethnic groups uh, with different languages live side by side. So, what happens is there are some countries, there are number of countries in which multiple ethnic group people, they live side by side. Now, in that case, what happens is the bilingualism becomes the norm and each generation grows up the bilingual. One such example is the city state of Singapore in Southeast Asia, where if in Singapore you find that there are multiple ethnic groups of people, all of them bilingual and the, all of them uh, living uh, side by side. Now, as a former colony, uh, the Singapore uh, has English as the, la the lingua uh, franca, which is the second language in common on all ethnic groups of a given region. Now, lingua, uh, the lingua franca is basically the second language in common in all ethnic groups of the society. So, what happens in, in Singapore is that there are multiple number of, it is a British colony. So, here what happens is a multiple number of people live here 
who are all bilingual, they come from different parts of the country. So, here what happens the second language becomes most dominant. So, second language is common to all ethnic groups because they these ethnic groups they exchange ideas in English. Now, three ethnic groups in Singapore are Chinese, Malaya and Tamil, but spoken language within all of them is English and so this is what is called the, uh, the lingua uh, franca. While the three ethnic groups may not speak each other's language, they can generally communicate with each other in English. This uh, English is also the dominant language of Singapore, uh, meaning that it is the language of political and economic power with a bilingual society. So, dominant language, language of political and economic power within the uh, bilingual society and so dominant language here is always English, although this is the second language as you can see this is the lingua, uh, the lingua franca. Also English is also the main language of education, government and business in Singapore and so no matter how different uh, ethnic groups come and live here, they always speak the common language of English. Let us now look at something called code switching. So, what is code switching is basically how uh, bilinguals they uh, switch words while speaking. So, uh, uh, among the bilinguals the different languages are often associated with different environments or con context. On one hand we have the heritage language may be used at home in the family member. So, uh, most bilinguals use the heritage in, in their uh, uh, in their family life or topics related to the family. The societal language is a language which is spoken by majority of friends and people in the society and is easier to use when discussing topics outside of the issues. Now, this must be the case for the first generations immigrants who command the societal language is uh, relatively weak. Thus, bilinguals often engage in something called code switching and so what is it? It is a change from one language to another. Uh, within a single interaction. So, when I am speaking that is what I what, what I also tend to do when I am speaking with uh, in my lec uh, lectures, I keep on switching between the Hindi and English and why do I do it? Because there are some concepts which can be explained in Hindi better and some concepts that can be explained in English better and so I find this and I keep on doing this code switching. So, can be uh, the code switching occurs between sentences in a conversation or even within the sentences and is observed even in young bilingual children. So, bilinguals are associated with different forms of language from different topics. Heritage language may be used, in the, uh, used at home for daily life issues. Also, societal language may be used for more relevant issues outside the home. <coughs> what is code switching? It is a change from one language to another within a single interaction and they can even occur within a single utterances. It's, it is not that one sentence will be in a particular language and the other sentence will be in another language. What could happen in a single sentence? People will, will be able to switch between two different languages and this property of switching between two languages in a single utterance or in multiple utterances is what is called code switching. Bilinguals have a good sense of interlocutor language abilities which uh, language will be best to convey the intended meaning. Now, code switching reflects what does code code switching actually do? It reflects a deep pragmatic knowledge on the part of the speaker. The, uh, the speaker has a very well idea or good idea of the pragmatics of the language. Code switching is not just the result of a language failure. Code switching is exactly not language failure. It is not that some <coughs> somebody when using Hindi instead of English is failed to explain the English word or failed to repeat the English word. What happens is it arises out of the skill craft, crafting of language to the appropriate context. Now, why I do code switching that is because it is not that I do not know the English word for it. Why I am using codes and code switching is because I believe that uh, the <coughs> language that the shifting that I am doing is appropriate for that context and so I am using some words or expressions can be explained better in India. So, I am doing the code switching. So, code switching basically is not the uh, failure of a particular language. Also a more formalized type of code switching is in terms of the translation. Now, the social dynamics of translations are complex in nature and they involve interactions between members of the dominant and the subordinate classes and the translator though able to speak both the languages is still viewed as a member of the subordinate groups. So, bilingual speakers choice of language depends more on the pragmatic factors uh, with their own competence. There is a strong pressure of the use of lang uh, local language uh, whenever possible. Also, bilingual speakers tend to use native languages of their interlocutors because it increases the likelihood of their 
uh, intended message will be understood. So, they use the uh, language of the inter interlocutor because they believe that the language will be understood, they will be understood better. And finally, in interactions between speakers of the dominant and minority language, the burden of understanding falls onto the non-dominant language speaking people. So, if I go to United States tomorrow, my, the burden of use of language of English will be falling on me because uh, of course, people from the United States will not like to understand Hindi or not like to uh, put effort to understanding Hindi and so the burden lies on me to speak or exchange ideas in English. Translation is a formal uh, form of code switching as I said translation is a form of uh, codes, code switching. Now, bilinguals choose language based on pragmatic factors, not owing competence. Select dominant language of interlocutors to maximum the understanding. Also, they experience pressure to use dominant language outside the home. Now, there is something called bilingual ac accommodation. What is it? It is the sensitivity to ethnic identity of interlocutor in selecting which language to use. Two-year-old bilingual children accommodate to interlocutors. So, basically it, it is the ability or sensitivity of the ethnic group to use the correct form of language. Also, there is something called language negotiation. Young, young bilinguals become skillful at language negotiation, which is a process in which the bilinguals, the in, uh, interlocutors work together to decide which language to use. So, bilingual interlocutors work together to decide which language to use and this is called the language negotiation in different conversations. Now, receptive bilingualism, ability to understand a second language without being able to speak it. Now, this is this are another form of bilingualism where I can understand the second language, but I am not able to speak it. Danish and Swedish for example, and French and German speaking Swiss across generations in immigrant families. Now, this is called the receptive uh, uh, bilingualism. Language and identity. So, language as an integral part of a person's identity. Uh, and bilinguists use languages to establish their identity, which may vary as they move from one societal group to another. The first generation immigrants typically maintain heritage language and cultural identity. Also, second generation typically identifies the societal language and the culture. And so, this is where the shift is. The heritage language is mostly of the first generation and the second generation onwards are using most of the societal language. Language and recall of personal memories, childhood experiences recall more vividly uh, with greater emotion in the first language. And so, when doing something called uh, hypnotherapy, it is always better to use the uh, first language or the mother tongue of the person, the from the heritage language of a person because childhood experiences are more vividly. Uh, expressed in the heritage language. Bilingual psychotherapy, clients may find it easier to discuss early traumatic events in the second language and so this has to do with the use of the second language. Now, the since we have understood a little bit of how bilingualism works and what are the various uh, factors affecting it. Next, let us look at the organization of the bilingual mind, how the bilingual mind is organized. So, bilinguals, balanced bilinguals activate both languages at the same time that they speak. Now, bilinguals rarely confuse with the two language. It seems that uh, logical to assume that the bilingual mind actually houses uh, each language separately. Now, if you look at a bilingual, for example, I am a bilingual, if you are looking at me, I can speak English and Hindi both at the same time. And so, it is a good proposition to understand that I am housing two lexicons in my mind and both of them are, uh, uh, are uh, working in parallel. Empirical evidences clearly show that bilinguals, they activate both languages every time they speak, uh, even when the dominant language is in strictly monolingual situations. So, even in mono, strictly monolingual situations where I am doing all interactions in English, I am also activating Hindi and that is how the bilingual, uh, uh, lang, uh, bil, uh, bilingual people really work. Now, it is less clear whether there is also the case with unlingual, uh, unbalanced bilingual, that is a person who has limited ability to speak a second language. And so, what happens in most balanced bilingual, we have both the languages acting at the same time. Now, evidence for joint activation of both languages in the bilingual, they come from a number of different approaches. Now, different, different uh, number of different approaches have been used, which basically believe that bilinguals, they activate both the language areas of the brain when they are speaking. Now, they show that bilinguals cannot simply shut off one language while making word judgments in the other language. So, lexical decision task, a lexical decision task is used to 
test whether both the languages are activated at the same time when bilinguals are working. So, bilinguals cannot shut off L1 which is the first language while making word judgment in the L2 which is the second language. In my case Hindi is the first language and English is the second language and so <coughs> this lexical design task says that I cannot shut off L1 when I am using L2. Similarly, Spanish English bilinguals they are slow reaction time for noche is word in English because it is a word in Spanish also. And so, this word which is a non word in English and a word in uh, Spanish, this takes uh, uh, Spanish English people take more time. But English Spanish speakers for English monolinguals, of, of course, English is monolingual, so they do not have to learn a Spanish. But if they learn Spanish, then what will happen is the reaction time would be reversed out. Cross language priming, another way of <coughs> looking at how uh, the both the areas of the brain are activated or both the mental lexicons are uh, activated. Words in L1 aids retrieval of words with relative meaning in L2. Now, cross language pri priming in which words from first language in Hindi prime us in English and uh, what it says is that words uh, in L1 which is in Hindi it aids retrieval of words in the meaning of L2. Now, German English bilinguals, um, if they are looking at this kind of thing, if they are shown them arts, they is primed for nuts. So, if they show them arts, which is exactly the meaning of a doctor in German, and later on you show them nurse, the priming, the reaction time for understanding this word is uh, faster. Eye tracking data also. So, visual array contains both markers and postage stamp, marka in Russian. Now, English monolinguals here is mark, they looks for the marker. Russian English speakers may look for markers or postage stamp. So, what happens is in the eye tracking experiment what happened is uh, Russian English speaking and the English monolingual were taken and so they were given several objects to look at and the eyes were tracked. In one case you had a postage stamp and you also had a marker in front of you and the word that you have to look at was or the word that you have to look uh, find an object was for marker. Now, for English marker as soon as they heard the word marker their eyes moved to the marker which was on the table, but then the Russian English uh, bilinguals they first looked at postage stamp which is basically a uh, which is called marka in Rus uh, Russian and then later on they translated to English and looked at the marker which is there and so the lo lot of um, uh, 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 higher reaction time was resulted. Now, links between the two languages. So, how the two languages in terms of bilingual's brain, how the two languages are related. Now, vocabularies of the two languages are linked at the conceptual level. It is believed by some experiments suggest, suggest that the vocabularies of the two languages for bilinguals are they related at the conceptual level. Now, uh, which basically means that whatever you say or talk about in one language, you can also talk about in another language. Now, words in the two different languages, they refer to the same concepts are called translational equivalence. So, the translational equivalence basically says that they are able to switch between languages and so and the uh, when we are referring to language 1 and language 2, they are referring to the same concept and that is why this is called translational equivalence. So, words in the two languages that refer to the same concept, for example, dog in sheen in sheen in France, uh, dog in English and sheen in France, if we are referring to it what happens is we are referring to the dog and so the dog is activated. An interesting issue with translational equivalent is the idea that how they learn the first, uh, how they are learned at the first place. So, both, both dog and hund for that matter, they refer to the same legged animal which is the conceptual idea of it. And so, no matter what they uh, look into this, the translational equivalent is this and so the same time should be activated. Now, <coughs> the mutual executive exclusivity principle. Young children assume that new words must refer to the novel concept, but they do not assume that this when learning a new word in another language. Children growing up as bilinguals have some, some awareness that separate linguistic systems are uh, in use. Now, for, li uh, for people, for children of the monolingual system, this kind of problem may arise, but for bilinguals they start with the idea that separate say, things, uh, 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 separate linguistic systems would mean uh, different kind of things. Now, sometimes there are words in the two languages that have similar form and meaning and these are called as the cognates. What are cognates? <coughs> what we are trying to express is the link between the two languages. Words of the two languages that have similar form and meaning are called the cognates. So, the cognates are basically the words from the two languages which are similar in form and meaning. Now, English and German have many cognates because they come from a co common origin. So, the spelling would be different, but the form and the meaning would be same. For example, look at cafe which is coffee and coffee 
in uh, English. As you look into it, what happens is cafe and coffee or FL and apple in English, they are the same. Now, English and French have many cognates because they are massive borrowing from French to English and so uh, English Germans are also the same because the same Germanic language. Now, according to the principle of uh, cognates, cognates occur because of two reasons. Why do cognates occur? Because of two reasons. One reason is that some languages are related to each other and thus share a certain amount of vocabulary. The other reason being that <coughs> has German English share a number of cognates for example, man and man. In German you have man and in English you have man. Also you have wein which is wine in uh, <coughs> English or if you have buyer in German which is beer in English. So, another reason for cognate is that a language often borrows the name of a concept. Uh, both the languages they borrow of the concept they acquire from other cultures. So, they, both the uh, languages are borrowing the concept from the other culture and so that is the reason for the existence of the uh, cognates. Now, all, uh, there, there may be uh, other words which are called the interlingual homographs. Now, words in the two languages that have similar form but different meanings. Uh, for example, these and these are called false friends. So, the, it, it may be possible that the <coughs> two languages have the same word, but they have different meaning and these are called the interlingual homographs and also called false friends. For example, in German you have chef which actually means boss, but in English uh, <coughs> chef actually means the chef who actually cooks. Also gift means poison uh, in, in both the languages. So, both means are temporarily activated as measured by N400 and it is believed that both uh, meanings in a bilingual, in an English German bilingual, both the meaning, for example, chef the boss and chef the chef, uh, the cooking chef, both are activated at the same time when an English German person is using these uh, interlingual homographs. Now, what are the disadvantages of uh, of bilingualism. Before that, we should look at some common cognates with English, German and uh, French. So, you have house here in German, you have house in English, you have reason in French, you have reason. You have God and you have got here, land and land here, friend and frond here, sun and zone here, moon and moon here, mother and muta here, and brother and bruder here, also sun and shone here. In, in terms of French, you have reason and reason, season and saison weave and bear off, biscuit and biscuit which is the same, bucket and bucket, robe and robe here and so what you see is that these are cognates and similar uh, form words. Now, what is the disadvantage of being a bilingual? Now, compared with monolingual, bilinguals have uh, smaller vocabularies in each language. Since you are a bilingual, you may not have that much number of vocabulary or that amount of vocabulary in both the language. And so, one of the obvious reasons of a um, uh, disadvantage is uh, that bilinguals do not have enough vocabulary in both the languages. Also, more difficult retrieving words. Since they do not have enough vocabulary, it is obvious that the bilinguals will not be able to retrieve words or retrieve enough words um, in, in from both the linguistic systems. Now, this is this kind of problem with uh, the, the monolingual and bilingual is that this is true for both children and adults. Also measurable in the lab, but they are not noticed impact on daily language use. Now, although these kind of problems may exist for monolinguals and uh, difference between monolingual and bilingual, but the, you do not see bilinguals suffering in any way in a daily use of language. Now, compared with monolinguals, bilinguals experience more tip of the tongue states. The tip of the tongue phenomena uh, is uh, when you are able to know a word. Uh, you know a word, but cannot name it. And how, how, how does it happen? The tip of the, tum, uh, tip of the tongue phenomena, it happens because you are not able to uh, uh, le uh, retrieve the lexical access. You are not given the lexical access or the symbol of the word or the meaning of the word. Now, some researchers have made the proposal that can bilingual disadvantage can be expected in terms of uh, lower word uh, frequencies. Now, semantic categorization task participants uh, would in, in the, you, the difference between bilinguals and, uh, and monolinguals or the bi bilingual disadvantage has been measured using something called the semantic categorization task. Here, the participants have to name members of a category, furniture, chair, table, sofa and desk and bilinguals name fewer items than monolinguals. In a lexical decision task also, it has been found that monolinguals discriminate words from non-word by considering whether the string looks familiar, but bilinguals do so by considering whether the string has meaningful or not. Now, 
since the bilingual have two languages, so they do not look at the surface word and then make this distinction of lexical decision task in terms of word non word. When uh, distinguishing a word from a non word, the bilingual will actually do the dis distinguishing or actually distinguish uh, words uh, based on something called the meaning part of it or at the uh, uh, at the semantic form of it. Tip of the tongue phenomena, it has informed it is a temporary difficulty in lexical retrieval mainly from less common words. Now, compared with monolinguals, bilinguals experience more TOT states. That happens because uh, uh, that will bilingual disadvantage can explain in terms of lower word uh, frequencies. This is known as the word link hypothesis. Now, according to these views, bilinguals are less practiced at using the words they know compared to monolinguals and so they have more difficulty accessing them. That is what I was trying to explain you the weaker link hypothesis is explained that bilingual disadvantage in terms of lower word frequencies in each language. Also bilinguals split time between two languages, so less practiced using words in one language. Also less practice leads to more difficulty in lexical access and this is why the TOT phenomena, the tip of the tongue phenomena happens in uh, bilinguals more than in monolinguals. Inferring hypothesis, so an alternate experience for the bilingual disadvantage is in lexical retrieval is something called the inferring hypothesis and so what is the inference hypothesis? I am sorry, it is called the interference hypothesis. So, what is the interference hypothesis? What does it say? This is a proposal that bilingual disadvantage can be explained in terms of interference from translation equivalence of the unusual language. What happens is when you are doing a transfer, when you are doing a trans translation of from one language to another, a translational equivalent may interfere with the retrieval, lexical retrieval of the first language and so that can lead to the slower reaction times. So, it explains bilingual disadvantage in terms of interference from translational equivalence. For example, French English bilinguals attempts to retrieve dog, but sheen interferes with it. Now, since bilinguals can never turn off the other language uh, when they are speaking, the two languages will always compete for activation and uh, this competition will lead to interference in lexical access, but uh, slower than uh, slower the process uh, down of retrieval. Bilingual speakers need to constantly inhabit intrusions from unintended language thus making the lexical access more effortful and so bilinguals take more time in explaining um, uh, any word for that matter. Now, while the bilingual disadvantage is clearly measurable in the laboratory, it is also important to note that this does not lead to any noticeable problem. So, bilinguals do not have any noticeable problem in uh, general day to day life. When two languages are closely related, bilingual disadvantage can exactly be reduced. So, if you are talking about German and uh, French or German and Dutch, this bilingual disadvantage is is negligible at the best. Now, there is a model of bilingual uh, lexicon which is called the revised hierarchical model. What is this model? Uh, several models have been proposed for explaining biling uh, bilingualism lexicon. Now, how the vocabularies of the two languages are organized in the bilingual mind. The most popular is called the revised hierarchical model and so the proposed by Kroll and Seward. Now, this theory of bilingual uh, language processing, uh, it assumes separate lexicon for each language connected by a common underlying uh, at the conceptual level. So, the theory of bilingual language processing it believes that there are separate lexicons for each language and they are commonly uh, underlying conceptual level. So, if N1 is, is the concept for first language, L2 is the concept for the second language, uh, L1 is the first language, L2 is the second language, they are bound together at the conceptual level and this is what the uh, theory actually says. Two lexicons are there. So, this is the lexicon 1 for the first language, this is the lexicon 2 for the second language and this is the conceptual language where these two lexicons are connected. Two lexicons connected by direct link and indirectly through conceptual level. Strength of each link depends on the proficiency of the bilingual. So, if you have profession, if you have pro profession in both the language, then each, each strength is very good by the conceptual level. If you have profession in L1 and not profession in L2, the strength here will be lesser and that is how it has been explained. One language is dominant, the reverse uh, revised hierarchical model proposes that some of the links are weaker than the other. Now, as I explained that balance for balanced bilingual, all links are equally strong cross linguistic priming is in either direction. So, both the links are strong and so conceptually they can activate the same word, same meaning and so here the priming will be very good or conceptual priming will be very good. 
unbalanced bilingual easier to translate from L2 to L1 priming uh, L1 to L2, but not L2 to L1. So, if you have a weaker model, so the revised hierarchical model proposed separate lexicon for each language with an underlying common conceptual layer. Solid links are strong and dotted links are weak reflecting data from translation and cross priming studies. So, if both the both are strong, there will be easy access between them and the concepts there. But if L2 is weak and L1 is strong, this lexicon is strong, this lexicon is weak, this is the lexical language is happening. The conceptual link connection between L1 is, is higher, this is slower and so the translation between L1 and L2 will also be lower. Translational equivalent revisited. So, what is it? Translational equivalents rarely mean exactly the same thing. Rushke, in Russian, chaska means cup, but rarely means drinking vessel with a handle. Russian stecken means glass, but really means drinking vessel without a handle. The more abstract the concept, the more the meaning of translational equivalence have to diverge. And so, if you are looking at bilinguals, what happens is the translational equivalence or the more abstract concepts are there, the more difficult the translational equivalence become. Now, Chinese verbs are the most difficult to do a translation to get a translational equivalent. For example, in Chinese, the word kai translates as open. open door, window, bank account, book, everything. Turn on, uh, also there is a translation equation, light, window, air conditioning, drive a car. So, the more abstract a concept is, the more the meaning of translational equivalence diverges and verbs are the more abstract than nouns and they are notoriously difficult to translate. That is what I have been telling you. So, even translation equivalence for common objects have non-overlapping meaning. Com compare the English word cup and glass with Russian words of chaska and staken. The English word cup, Russian chaska, English word cup, Russian staken and English word glass, Russian staken. We look at something called the sense model. The sense model is a theory of bilingual language uh, processing that takes into account the fact that most words from multiple meaning that do not fully overlap across a language. According to the sense uh, model, what happens is priming activates all senses or meaning of the word. Uh, so, what happens is when, when in a sense model what happens is you are activating one language, uh, the meaning of it through all senses not only the visual but auditory or other senses also activated and that is how you develop the conceptual meaning. So, theory of bilingual language processing takes into account the fact that most words have multiple meaning. These meanings do not fully, uh, uh, fully overlap in a language. Priming activates all senses all meaning or meanings of a word, but cross linguistic priming depends on shared senses between the translation equivalents. L1 leads to L2 priming less likely because bilinguals know fewer L2 senses. Bilingual faster than translating concrete words, more overlapping senses than picture abstract words. Now, strength of sense model is that it cannot account for observing that bilinguals are faster in translating concrete words which tend to have more overlapping meaning than they are at the abstract level. Words do not just link with abstract concepts, they can also elicit powerful imagery that can vary by culture. So, even uh, very close translational equivalence can be associated with different pro prototypal meaning of the two language. Picture naming task in Chinese English bilingual name, Chinese typically pictures faster when responding in Chinese, Western typical, Western typical pictures faster when responding in English and so this is what the sense model actually says. Now, according to the sense model, translational priming from L2 to L1 is strong because all L2 sense map onto L1 senses. As I said, when, when I am activating a word, there are different senses which are activated. Now, however, translation priming from L1 to L2 is weak because only few L1 senses map onto the L2 senses. The model predicts that for native speakers of Chinese, priming for open which is kai should be stronger than for kai open because kai has other senses that do not map into open. So, open would mean kai if I am doing this priming, but if I am doing kai to open priming, it is difficult because kai can read to all other different kind of words. So, this is kai, kai man, kai shwangu, kai shout, kai deng, kai chi. But if I am looking at L2 open, this is basically open the door, open the window, open the drawer, turn on the light. So, turn on is one thing and drive a car. This is word senses and these are the word forms which are there. Now, in a picture naming task, Chinese English bilinguals are faster to respond to long when they see the typical Chinese image and they are faster to respond to dragon when they see the western typical image. Now, this is Chinese typical image, this is dragon, western typical image of a dragon and so depending on which uh, if it is Chinese, uh, Chinese English um, and which kind of image will lead to which kind of priming out there. 
So, that brings an end to this particular section or this particular lecture. Now, I will do a quick review of what we actually did in this lecture. So, we started off by looking at uh, how uh, uh, what is bilingualism and what are the different kind of uh, uh, bilingual properties which are there and we looked at how languages uh, are explained or how languages and dialects they vary and um, uh, how uh, bilingualism uh, is multi generational and so how does bilinguals fit into the world. We also looked at the property of code switching which is used by bilingual and so what are the properties of that and when it is beneficial and when it is not and we looked at how language choice is done by bilinguals. We also looked at looked at how bilingualism provides an identity to people from the bilingual uh, uh, field. Next, we looked at how the bilingual mind is act, uh, is organized and so the most prominent theory says that there are two different language uh, systems lexicons and they are connected to uh, at the conceptual level. So, we looked at how they are connected, how cross language pri priming and, and eye tracking ex ex uh, experiments explain this. Uh, we also looked at what are translational equivalents and what is mutual exclusivity and what evidence they provide to the fact that they are either there is a single or a multiple uh, lexicon for bilingualism. We looked at the link between the two language in terms of cognates which are words having similar meaning in both the forms and in, in terms of interlingual homographs. We also looked at what is the disadvantage of using being a bilingual. So, compared with bi monolinguals what are the disadvantages of being a bilingual and we, we looked at in terms of uh, the lexical decision task, the semantic categorization task and the tipo tongue phenomenon. We also looked at how does this bilingual disadvantage come from in terms of the weak link hypothesis and the interference hypothesis and then we finally looked at something called the revised hierarchical model of bilingualism uh, which explained uh, the difference between bi balanced and non-balanced bilinguals. And and uh, we looked at how the sense model explains this disadvantage in, uh, in bilingualism in terms of how the two uh, lexicons, the first language lexicon and the second language lexicon are combined together. When we meet next here, we will continue this discussion and uh, take it through into looking at cognitive factors in bilingualism. But till we do that and meet next, it is thank you and goodbye from here.